We're so pleased this evening to have with us Dr. John Nagel. We've been able to spend the day with him at other events, and uh, our lives have been enriched for his visit, and uh, we hope that we'll be able to talk him into uh, coming back. He's uh, been extremely insightful and, and uh, the perfect gentleman, and we're pleased to have him here. Dr. John Noggle is the president of the Center for a New American Security. This is a think tank in Washington, D.C. He is also a member of the Defense Policy Board, a visiting professor in the War Studies Department at King's College of London, a life member on, of the Council on Foreign Relations and the Veterans of Foreign Wars, and a member of the International Institute of Strategic Studies. Dr. Nagel is a distinguished graduate of the United States Military Academy, class of 1988, who served as an armor officer in the U.S. Army for 20 years. His last military assignment was as commander of the 1st Battalion, 34th Armor at Fort Riley, Kansas, training transition teams that embed with Iraqi and Afghan units. He led a tank platoon in Operation Desert Storm and served as the operations officer of a tank battalion task force in Operation Iraqi Freedom, earning the Combat Action Badge and the Bronze Star Medal. Dr. Noggle taught national security studies at West Point's Department of Social Sciences and in Georgetown University's Security Studies Program and served as a military assistant to two deputy secretaries of defense. He earned his Master of the Military Arts and Sciences degree from the U.S. Army Command and General Staff College, where he received the George C. Marshall Award as the top graduate, and his doctorate from Oxford University as a Rhodes Scholar. Dr. Noggle is the author of Earning to Eat Soup with a Knife, Counterinsurgency Lessons from Malaya and Vietnam, and was on the writing team that produced the current U.S. Army Marine Corps Counterinsurgency Field Manual. Dr. Noggle's title this evening comes from the title of his book, Learning to Eat Soup with a Knife, Lessons from Iraq for Afghan Afghanistan and Beyond. Dr. Noggle. Thanks, Richard, for that kind introduction. Thanks to the Wheatley Institution for having me here today, a, a spectacular day for me at the end of a, a very interesting week. Uh, over the past seven days, I've uh, spoken or chaired panels at the U.S. Naval Academy, at West Point, at the Air Force Academy last night, and now here at BYU. Uh, I'm calling it my Party College Tour 2011. <laughs> It's been um, a little bit humbling um, for me going to all of those places full of, of, of wonderful young people who are dedicated to making the world a better place and who make sacrifices in order to accomplish that. And, and uh, I put all of you in that same category. I'm, I'm honored by the presence of, of so many Reserve Officer Training Corps cadets here in the room tonight, military veterans, um, those, those who have, have gone in harm's way. All of you who are here tonight are, are concerned about, care about, think about um, what our men and women are, are doing in Iraq and Afghanistan around the globe. And it's a, a privilege to be able to talk to you uh, about some of what they're doing, to tell you how we got to where we are and to provide, I hope, some ideas on, on where I think we're going to go next. And, and this story for me really starts with my first war with Operation Desert Storm, um, discouragingly before most of you in this room were born. Uh, a, a, a fascinating war, a great little war. We took the Iraqi army from the fourth largest in the world to the second largest in Iraq in a period of about 100 hours. And after that war, after that experience, uh, I, I had a tank platoon. Um, I've got uh, uh, a friend who was providing air cover. Um, and and uh, tough for this Army guy to say, but it really was the Air Force who, who softened him up for us. Um, after that war, I became convinced 
that with the demise of the Soviet Union, with the easy, comparatively easy defeat of the, the fourth largest army in the world, that we were so good at tank on tank, fighter plane on fighter plane kind of warfare that nobody was going to fight us that way anymore if they had half a chance. I became convinced that, that if they had the choice, they'd choose to fight us not as conventional armies, but as insurgents and terrorists. And so after Desert Storm, when, when I got the chance to go back to Oxford to, to work on my doctorate, uh, because we all make sacrifices for national security, I decided to look at that other kind of war, at insurgency and terrorism. And if you're, if you're studying that kind of war at Oxford, you have to read the work of T.E. Lawrence, Lawrence of Arabia. And, and Lawrence was actually not a counterinsurgent, but an insurgent. He was leading a group of guerrillas, a band of Arab guerrillas, against a conventional Turkish army in the First World War. And he actually felt sorry for them. He said, for them, we must be like a vapor. We rise up out of the sand, we congeal, we strike, and then we dissolve back into the sand. They're left with nothing to hit, nothing to swing at. For them, making war on us must be messy and slow, like eating soup with a knife. And I read that particular phrase in the bathtub. I've been for a run at Oxford on the Port Meadow, it's what you do. And, and I was sitting in the bathtub, drinking champagne, eating strawberries, reading Seven Pillars of Wisdom. It's Oxford, right? It, it's okay there. And, and, and non-alcoholic champagne. And, and, and I came out of the tub, I was so excited. I said, Eureka, Eureka, I've found it, I've found it. I have the title of my dissertation. And my wife said, that's nice, honey. Go put some clothes on, please. And, and so I had, I had five words down, eating soup with a knife, 99,995 words to go, right? And, and all of you uh, have written and are probably supposed to be tonight writing term papers. So to come up with those 99,995 words, I decided to compare two previous counterinsurgency campaigns, the British Army in Malaya and the American Army in Vietnam. And the British Army fought a counterinsurgency campaign in a place called Malaya, what, what we today call Malaysia, from 1948 to 1960. And they started badly. Conventional armies tend to start badly when they're fighting insurgencies, because that's not what they're designed to do. They're designed to fight other armies. But the Brits figured it out. They adapted and they learned and they ultimately defeated their insurgent enemies in what is today widely viewed as the classic case of successful Western counterinsurgency in the 20th century. And it only took them 12 years, right? So when, when Lawrence said messy and slow, he wasn't kidding. And I compared that case with the American army in Vietnam, which also started badly when fighting insurgents, as we would expect which also adapted and learned, as we would expect. But it didn't learn fast enough. When a great power loses a small war, it does so because it runs out of only one thing. A great power is not going to run out of tanks or fighter planes. If it loses a small war, it's going to lose it because it runs out of national will. And that's what happened in Vietnam, with horrible consequences for the people of South Vietnam, who suffered horribly. Uh, for the, the people of Cambodia, the Khmer Rouge came to power as a direct result of, of our failures in Vietnam. Uh, you should, uh, I hope you've seen the killing fields, uh, the story of, of what happened then and there, and also with horrific consequences to the American army, which took a full generation to recover. And so I concluded my doctoral dissertation that, that Armies that can adapt and learn, that can figure out how to fight against all kinds of enemies, have a great advantage and give their, their nations a great advantage in the international system. And I argued that we needed to learn how to conduct counterinsurgency more effectively. And I finished that, that book in 1990, the dissertation in 1997. It was ultimately published in 2002. And, and I was told I was crazy for writing on counterinsurgency. 
because we weren't going to do that kind of thing anymore. And, and I was so crazy that I couldn't find anybody to publish the thing. And, and then I finally got it published. And, and Newt Gingrich, of all people, read it and, and talked about it on Fox News, Fair and Balanced, and said something very carefully. Newt said, Noggle's book is probably the best book that has been written by an American on counterinsurgency in modern times. And I can absolutely guarantee you that that was a true statement, because it was the only book. <laughs> and, and so um, the idea of counterinsurgency uh, again came into the popular discussion. And what I'm going to do um, next is, is talk you through how that idea uh, came to prominence in the war in Iraq and, and what, uh, what is happening now in Afghanistan. The key points I'd like to leave you with. The United States as a, as a country, as a nation, but the US Army in particular, neglected counterinsurgency in the wake of Vietnam. We decided we weren't going to do that kind of thing anymore. Despite that, we adapted and we learned. We figured out how to practice counterinsurgency effectively in Iraq, and we're now applying those same principles in Afghanistan. Unfortunately, for a number of reasons which I'll discuss. I think Iraq and Afghanistan are the kind of wars we're most likely to fight in years to come. And therefore, I'm going to argue, we've got to continue to get better at fighting this kind of war. We've got to figure out how to do this as effectively and as efficiently as we possibly can. Because until we are as good at this kind of war as we are at this kind of war, our enemies are going to keep coming at us as terrorists and insurgents. And we've come a long way, but we still have a long way to go. We still have a lot of learning to do. And many of you in this room, whether you're, you're going to serve the U.S. government in uniform, uh, serve the government not in uniform, in the State Department, the Agency for International Development, any of a dozen other agencies, or just if you're going to be an informed American citizen, you should know about this learning process, about what it takes to win these wars, because they are likely to recur over and over again in your future. And if, if you understand, if you want to understand the American military, I really think you have to understand Vietnam and what happened in Vietnam. An enormously difficult war for the United States. We actually did figure out how to conduct counterinsurgency uh, relatively uh, late in the game. Uh, Bob Sorley, a, a fellow West Point graduate, uh, historian, professor, a uh, wonderful man, uh, uh, real name Lewis, goes by Bob. Uh, Bob has written a number of books and is about to publish another one. Um, the, this book uh, um, is about General Westmoreland, and the subtitle sort of gives away uh, what he thinks. Uh, the, the subtitle is, uh, it's Westmoreland, the general who lost the war in Vietnam. By, by the end of the Vietnam War under Creighton Abrams, we had in fact figured it out, but Jack Keane, the Vice Chief of Staff of the Army, and a very important man in the evolution of the war in Iraq, watched as, as we went downhill in Iraq after the initial invasion quickly turned to dust in our, sand, in, in, to, to, to dust in our mouth. And, and General Keane went on the Jim Lehrer News Hour in a very important moment in April of 2006, as, as violence in Iraq was spiraling uh, into a civil war, a full civil war between the Sunnis and the Shia. And General Keene told Jim Lehrer that the army on the battlefield in Iraq didn't have any doctrine, it wasn't educated or trained to deal with insurgency because after Vietnam, we purged ourselves of all of that. In hindsight, he said that was a bad decision and I love Jack Keane for the last three words. He said, we have responsibility. And this was the first time, to my knowledge, that a senior uh, American official took responsibility for what was happening in Iraq as that war was spiraling downhill. And, and General Keane played an important role in the events that will follow. It wasn't just General Keane who thought that the decision to ign neglect, ignore counterinsurgency after Vietnam was a bad idea. Secretary of Defense Bob Gates, in a, a remarkable speech to the Association of the United States Army, uh, with the, the Chief of Staff of the Army, the Secretary of the Army, standing right in front of him, 
hit the army pretty hard. This was in 2007. General, uh, Secretary Gates said, in the years following Vietnam, the army relegated unconventional war to the margin, leaving the service unprepared to deal with what followed. And if you wear the uniform of our nation, the worst thing someone can say about you is that you are unprepared. And the Secretary of Defense, in my eyes, the best Secretary of Defense we ever had, indicted not just an individual, but his entire army, saying that the army had not been ready to do what the nation needed it to do in a whole series of operations. Pretty rough stuff from a very well-respected Secretary of Defense. That's the bad news. But there is good news. Despite the fact that we weren't ready, we can adapt and learn. A, a, a doctoral dissertation and then a book by Richard Downey published as The U.S. Army is Learning Institution, which I will assure you is not an oxymoron. Uh, Richard Downey said, organizational learning is a process by which an organization uses new knowledge or understanding gained from experience or study to adjust norms, doctrine, and procedures in order to minimize gaps and maximize the chance for success. And one of the best things I get to do in, in this job, running a think tank in Washington, is, is run down to, to Quantico, Virginia, to the, the Marine Officer Corps basic course, and give this talk to brand new Marine officers. And in this 10th year of war, I am enormously proud to tell you that Quantico has expanded its Marine basic course for officers from 60 to 90. They're straining at the seams. They've got the, the lieutenants stacked in on top of each other. 10 years into this war, if, if for some reason, if you were a poor misguided soul and you decided you wanted to be a Marine officer and you went down to the recruiter and told him that, they don't have room for you this year and they're full for most of 2012. This generation, this greatest generation, this new greatest generation of young people is doing remarkable things, signing up for the military, knowing that they're going to war. But I talk to these Marine lieutenants and I, I show them this slide and I ask them, what's better guys, experience or study? And in a room full of Marine lieutenants, what do you think they wanna do? They want experience, right? God bless them. And I tell them, no guys, what you want to do is study. Way too many of my friends have gotten killed figuring this stuff out. Crack the books. That always makes me really popular with the Marine lieutenants. <laughs> this is what, uh, this, this is a picture. There's only one, of, one of just two diagrams in the talk and, the, and the, the only important thing in the talk are the two pictures. Um, and, 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 and what Richard Downey did is he took the organizational learning ideas of a man named John Boyd, in my eyes one of the best Air Force officers, certainly one of the best pilots of the 20th century. And, and John Boyd was, was uh, fighting in Korea over MiG Alley, uh, flying F-86 Sabre jets against uh, MiG-15s. You guys know the scene in Top Gun where it says, the enemy you are flying against is smaller, lighter, faster, and more maneuverable? Right? That's real. That was over MiG Alley. The MiG-15 was a, a smaller, lighter, faster, more maneuverable airplane than the F-86. And we were flying over their home turf. And despite that, we were shooting them down at a ratio of 9 to 1. And John Boyd tried to figure out why that was. And he came up with an idea he called the OODA loop. Uh, a pilot who observes what's going on, orients himself to the fight, decides what he wants to do, and acts faster than the enemy. A pilot who gets inside the enemy's OODA loop, or decision cycle, that pilot is going to win nine times out of ten. Right? And Richard Downey took that idea and he applied it not to, to an individual fighter pilot. Right? You know fighter pilots always talk with their hands like this? You Army guys, you know what the Army's version of this is? So Richard Downey, <laughs> one other one um, that I used last night at the Air Force Academy. Uh, uh, you, you Army guys, you know, what a, you know what a grunt says when he sees an F-16 fly overhead? <laughs> I spent a semester at the Air Force Academy on exchange from West Point. I heard that every day. <laughs> so back to Downey, back to OODA loops. Work with me, guys, work with me. So 
at, at, at 10 o'clock here. If the situation changes, if an army organized, designed, trained, and equipped to fight other armies suddenly finds itself fighting an insurgency at 12 o'clock, there are going to be individuals in the organization who pay attention to what's going on and identify organizational performance gaps. Hey, man, this isn't the enemy we wargamed against. They're going to come up with alternative organizational actions. That always happens all the time. The hard part is at 6 o'clock. The organization has to come to a sustained consensus that business has to change, that the organization has to do something profoundly different. If that happens, it is comparatively easy to transmit the new interpretation by publishing doctrine and, and making people follow a new set of rules. That should change the way the organization acts on the ground. In a healthy organization, this cycle repeats endlessly. In a successful organization, it repeats faster than the enemy. And, and this works really well for business. So Hewlett Packard and Dell are competing every day selling computers. And they can tell at the end of every day who's winning and who's losing. And they pay big money to these guys who come up with new ways to do business, new features, new things to, to get a foot in front of the competition, right? But it's much harder for armies because they don't do their actual business against a thinking opponent except about once in a generation. And so wrong ideas can get stuck in the army's head and it's really, really hard to get those ideas out. And I will tell you that the wrong ideas that were stuck in our head meant that the enemy was inside our OODA loop in Iraq until the end of 2006 and was inside our OODA loop in Afghanistan for different reasons until the start of 2009. And what changed at the end of 2006 was, among other things, the publication of this book, the U.S. Army Marine Corps Counterinsurgency Manual, Field Manual 3-24, published on December 15, 2006, downloaded a million and a half times in the month after it was published, translated and critiqued on jihadi websites, copies found in Taliban training camps in Pakistan. So we knew our enemies were reading it. We just had to get our guys to do that. Right. And, and that process of writing that book and implementing that book is what I'm going to talk to you about now. One of my favorite quotes is, is from, uh, attributed to Mark Twain, who said that, that history doesn't repeat itself, but it rhymes. And, and in fact, the, the whole idea of political science, of international relations, of military doctrine is drawn from the idea that, that there are trends in international relations, that there are factors that tend to drive human behavior in lots and lots of cases that work one after the other. And, and when Iraq was clearly starting to go wrong in 2004, General George Casey, the new commander there, asked for his counterinsurgency expert to figure out what he was doing right and what he was doing wrong. And the Army found a guy named Caleb Sepp, uh, called by his friends Gunner. His mom didn't call him that. Uh, I'd been an artilleryman before he became a Special Forces officer and, got, and then got a PhD from, from Harvard. Pretty smart guy. Gunner took a look at, at 30 previous counterinsurgency campaigns and figured out what worked and what didn't. And this is his list of what worked historically and what didn't. And he took his lists, best and worst practices in counterinsurgency, and traveled around Iraq in the summer of 2004. And what Gunner found in 2004 was that a majority of American units were doing a majority of unsuccessful practices everywhere he looked. So Gunner concluded that not only were we not winning in Iraq, what we were doing was making the situation worse. And, and Gunner's work started the process that led to the publication of the counterinsurgency manual. And, and this list, which, which, which Gunner published in an article in Military Review called Best and Worst Practices in Counterinsurgency, was so good, we thought, that we included it as the, the last paragraph in the first chapter of the counterinsurgency field manual uh, when we published it. 
This is the other. I said there were two diagrams that mattered. This is the other one. Uh, this diagram we stole um, shamelessly uh, from uh, then Major General Pete Corelli, now the Vice Chief of Staff of the Army. General Corelli commanded the 1st Cavalry Division in Baghdad in 2004-2005. And, and this diagram really explains counterinsurgency in one picture. And I'm going to use it to, to tell you the story of my own counterinsurgency fight in Al Anbar in 2004. So most of you probably do research and then write. Uh, I did the opposite. I wrote a book and then got sent to Al Anbar to research counterinsurgency myself for the first time. And, and I was sent to Al Anbar, Iraq's Wild West, and had responsibility for a town called Chaldea and, and the sector around it. And Chaldea, um, nice little town, it's between Ramadi, the capital of Al Anbar, and Fallujah. So it's a pretty nice neighborhood. Uh, I bought some land there. We were going to retire there, but, but <laughs> the schools are better in Alexandria, Virginia, so that's where we are. I, I, I had responsibility for, for about 60,000 souls in my sector. As near as I could tell, about one half of 1% of them, about 300 people, were actively trying to kill me and my guys. Uh, against those 300, I had a tank battalion task force, I had tanks, I had Bradleys, I had artillery, I had mortars, I had attack helicopters and attack aviation on call. All right. In a fair fight like this, it would have taken maybe three minutes. So cleverly, they refused to fight me that way. They were to use Mao's phrase, fish swimming in the sea of the people. The sea of the people who were neutral or passive or who actively supported the insurgency. And I've got to tell you, in El Anbar in 2004, the number of people who supported the government or coalition, that black box on the far left, that was probably about this high, right? But we couldn't have put that in the book. It would have been too depressing. And we, we couldn't have fit the words in. So we, we cut ourselves a break, right? And what you're trying to do when you're fighting a counterinsurgency campaign is not kill or capture every one of your enemies. Right? I took a lot more than 300 people off the battlefield over the course of my year in my sector. But their brothers, literally their brothers, decided to fight me in their place, in the place of those who had initially been fighting. Right? So if you're going to win this thing, if you're going to reduce the number of terrorists or insurgents to a level that can be handled by the Iraqi security forces, You've got to change the situation that leads people to fight. So do you run combat operations against bad guys? You can, I, you, you can find, you, absolutely. But you also have to train and employ host nation security forces, build an Iraqi police and an Iraqi army that are going to be able to stand on their own and protect their own people, because we don't want to stay there forever. Provide essential services to the population, give them good governance and economic development. And, and most importantly, the big gray arrow that encompasses all of the, the, the five black arrows, you've got to conduct effective information operations because ultimately you're trying to change people's minds. You're trying to convince them that they have a better future by backing the coalition and the government than they do by siding with the insurgents. And that can be really, really hard to do. One of the... Um, First things I tried to do when I got to, to Chaldea was work with the, the local police force. I studied counterinsurgency. I knew Gunner's List. I knew that, that, that building local police forces was the key to success in this kind of fight. And so I sent my best company commander on my first day in sector down to the local police station and told him to go on a joint patrol with the police and report back to me that night. And, and ben, ben reported in. And, and said, sir, I failed. And I was pretty surprised, pretty capable captain, good kid. I said, Ben, why did you let me down? Just, you know, twist the knife a little bit. And, and Ben said, sir, they were too fast. I couldn't catch any of them. I said, I'm sorry. He said, when we pulled up in our tanks to go on patrol with them, they ran away. They jumped out of the windows of the police station and got away, and they were too fast for us. We couldn't catch any of them. And that wasn't in the books, right? I'd, I'd, never, I'd read a lot of books on counterinsurgency. I'd never read about police jumping out of the police station like popcorn. So I said, all right, Ben, 
I sent a boy to do a man's job. Tomorrow I'll come with you and we'll go on a joint patrol together. And, and we did, but not because I was there, it's because Ben was ready for him this time. He had a couple of guys stripped down, not carrying their weapons, um, not, not wearing body armor, and they sprinted and pinned down two slow guys in a corner. And, and we ended up playing a wonderful Mutt and Jeff routine with an AK-47 before I finally convinced them that they were going to go on patrol with us despite their refusals, and, and the persuasion I had to use involved gunpoint. And these two Iraqi policemen, scared out of their wits, went on joint patrol with us at gunpoint. And I didn't understand at the time, but came to understand later as I talked to them and got to know them, that had they not been, been physically showing that we were compelling them to cooperate with them, that their heads were going to be hanging from that police station the next morning at dawn. Because I was the biggest dog in town when I was there, but I wasn't there all the time. And I certainly wasn't going to be protecting their families that night when the insurgents who really controlled the town at that point came to talk to them about their decision. All right. Now, over time, we pushed the insurgents out of town. We went, got to a situation where police were volunteering to go on joint patrols with us, and in one of my uh, a memory that I will never forget after a particularly horrific uh, improvised explosive device had, had cost us a lieutenant and his radio telephone operator and two Iraqi policemen. The other Iraqi police cooperated with us in, in cordoning off the site and in interrogating the local people to find out what was going on. But that is how hard and how messy and how slow this kind of war is. That is how hard it is to build people who will ultimately support the government. We got to that point to ultimately, after Iraq had descended to an extraordinarily bad position in the summer of 2006, when the Sunnis and Shia were in full-scale civil war with each other, when General Dave Petraeus came to Iraq, took command in Iraq in early 2007, and implemented this policy, this counterinsurgency strategy for the first time and fundamentally changed the dynamics of the conflict. What had been a sectarian war between Sunni and Shia uh, became uh, a situation in which the Sunni and the Shia continued not to, to get along completely well, but decided to compete politically rather than militarily. It was an extraordinary accomplishment. Petraeus was, was both lucky and good. I know he's been here in this great lecture series to, to talk to you. I'm sure he told you the story of, of how that happened, of how the Sunni decided to stop fighting against us and start fighting with us against Al-Qaeda in Iraq, our common enemy. It was one of the most extraordinary turnarounds in the history of American arms. And it has allowed us to, to draw down American troops to the point that, that at the height of the surge, we had about 180,000 US troops in Iraq. We're now down to 40,000 and, and on a glide path to go to zero by the end of this year. I personally don't think that zero is a good number. I think that Iraq remains unstable. I think that there are good reasons uh, why the Iraqis want us to stay, uh, the biggest one being Iran. Uh, Iraq currently has no jet aircraft uh, to defend its own airspace. It is going to continue to rely on the United States to defend its airspace for a number of years to come. It is buying the best tank in the world, the M1A1 tank. It's going to need help operating and maintaining those guys for a number of years to come. And so I, I ultimately expect that well past the last possible minute, the Iraqis will ask us to leave several thousand U.S. advisors on the ground uh, past this December 31st, and the administration has already said that it is willing to do that. This has been um, an extraordinary series of events in the history of the American military. This story is not yet over by any means, but it is a great story of learning and adaptation. And I'd like to, to think a little bit now about uh, another case um, where we also, I think, adapted very much in the nick of time. 
the decision to invade Iraq in 2003 before we had stabilized Afghanistan um, put the lie to, to one of my, my, my favorite quotes from St. Augustine, who said that the only purpose of a war is to build a better peace. And we had no choice but to fight the war to topple the Taliban in 2001 after they refused to turn over Al-Qaeda to us, after they decided to agree to give sanctuary to Al-Qaeda, we had no choice, in my eyes, in the eyes of the world, except to topple the Taliban and, and go after Al-Qaeda inside Afghanistan. But we had not completed the job. We had toppled the Taliban, but we had not built a better peace in the Afghanistan, in the post-Taliban Afghanistan before we turned our attention to Iraq. And, and Iraq grew so big and so bad and was so vital so quickly that quite frankly, we took our eye off the ball in Afghanistan. And we weren't able to refocus on Afghanistan until after General Petraeus had worked his trick, had implemented counterinsurgency, and had brought that war to, to a reasonable level of violence by the end of 2008. And so over the course of 2009, President Obama twice decided to dramatically increase the number of US troops in Afghanistan, first doubling them with a decision in March of 2009 from 30,000 to 60,000, and then deciding to add another 30,000 on December 1st, 2009, in a speech he delivered at West Point. Those troops meant that for the first time, we started to have what we had always needed in Afghanistan to provide security and stability to that country. They did not guarantee success by any means, largely because of the, the single biggest problem we face in Afghanistan, which is not Afghan government corruption, bad as that is, but is Afghanistan's neighbor, Pakistan. Historically, one of the things that makes an insurgency hardest to defeat is the presence of a sanctuary next door where the insurgents can, can resupply and, and can stage attacks into the territory in which the counterinsurgency campaign is being fought. And this is very much what Pakistan was as the Taliban rebuilt from 2002 until 2005 when they started reinfiltrating and very much what Pakistan remains today. And uh, Secretary of Defense Panetta, uh, the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, Admiral Mike Mullen, testified today. And Admiral Mullen, who has worked harder than anybody in the US government over the past several years to build good relations with Pakistan, said very directly that the Pakistani Intelligence Service, the ISI, the Inter Service Intelligence uh, Agency, directly supported the insurgents who attacked the U.S. Embassy compound last week. Pakistan has been playing a double game, working with us in some cases, but maintaining an insurance policy of a number of insurgent groups, most notably the Haqqani Network, or HQN, which it supports in, in order to have influence in Afghanistan after we leave. Admiral Mullen's statement was shocking. It's front page news uh, right now in both the Post and the Times. And it indicates frustration that is starting to boil over here in this country with Pakistan. Uh, that frustration uh, increased dramatically uh, when we discovered that Osama bin Laden was living in Abbottabad uh, next door a mile uh, from the Afghan Military Academy, the Afghan West Point. Uh, it has further increased with um, more intelligence uh, telling us that, that the Pakistani government is directly supporting insurgents. That problem of Pakistani support for the insurgency inside Afghanistan is the biggest problem we face in that war. Pakistan in general, according to Admiral Mullen, the most dangerous place in the world for the United States of America because it is a fragile democracy that harbors a number of insurgent groups, well over 100 nuclear weapons, and it's rapidly building more. Pakistan is the reason why Afghanistan matters 
so much to us. There is a little good news. Uh, we started taking the, the effort to build an Afghan army seriously in 2009. We put our best man uh, against it. We started to make progress in Iraq, building an Iraqi army, when we put Petraeus, then Lieutenant General Petraeus, against that problem in 2004. We put our best man, Lieutenant General Bill Caldwell, against the problem in Afghanistan, unfortunately, in 2009. And, and um, we, we don't yet have the Afghan forces to hold the territory where we clear the insurgents out of. David Galula, the, the great French theorist of counterinsurgency, author of the, the best book still on counterinsurgency written in the early 1960s, uh, David Galula's Counterinsurgency Warfare Theory and Practice. Galula said that counterinsurgency is only 20% military, it's 80% political, economic, information operations. The biggest political part of this fight is Pakistan, I believe that we will make some progress uh, against Pakistan. I, I strongly feel that Admiral Mullen's very, very firm statement, very public statement today will be helpful in putting more pressure against Pakistan. I don't believe that Pakistan will, will suddenly become 100% on our side, but I think we may be able to move them incrementally in the right direction. I also believe that there will be Americans serving in Afghanistan for a long, long time to come, although increasingly they will be advisors to a more capable Afghan military rather than fighting this war themselves. More good news. Sorry about this. Um, let me start on the good news side of the, the, the slide, which is the general war side, which, which you know, is a little counterintuitive, right? Um, the, the good news, as one thinks about the future of conflict, is that interstate war, war between great powers, is probably at the lowest level it has ever been since the Treaty of Westphalia, since the modern state system was, was uh, created. And that's for, for two reasons, um, at least two reasons. I, I, I will posit two reasons. Uh, first is the presence of nuclear weapons, which, which make it less likely that states who have nuclear weapons will go to war with each other. Um, the, 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 the fact that uh, um, we waged war, we, we, we declared a, um, an axis of evil, uh, North Korea, Iran, and, and Iraq, and North Korea has an invasion insurance. It has nuclear weapons. It is confident that it will not be invaded. Uh, that's one of the reasons why Iran is trying to uh, acquire nuclear weapons so hard. The other fact that, that minimizes the chances of general war is U.S. conventional superiority, which, which polices the world and, and minimizes the chances of general conflict. That's good news. There's bad news, ironically, under the stable peace uh, uh, annotation at the left of the slide. There are a number of factors that I think are going to put more and more pressure on governments. Uh, we're going to see increasing population growth. The, the world's population, currently 6 billion people, will be 9 billion people by 2050. Right. An extraordinary rate of population growth, mostly in the poorest and most vulnerable countries in the world, states in the world, many of which are going to face more and more pressure from climate change. Their governments are not going to be able to meet the needs of their people. Their governments are going to face insurgencies and terrorism. In many places, I predict, we will be helping those governments resist uh, terrorism and insurgency. Uh, we're seeing these pressures at work. This is, these are some of the drivers behind the Arab Spring uh, that has, has toppled dictatorships, leaving we're not quite sure yet what in, in Egypt, in Libya, in Tunisia, uh, revolts now in, in Syria, um, and an insurgency against the government of Yemen and we are actually supporting the government of Yemen uh, against the insurgency there. All these reasons are, are going to make stable peace less likely in the 21st century. What they mean, I'm afraid, is that for those of you wearing Army combat uniforms, uh, business is likely to be good for the remainder of the century. I'm not the only one who thinks so. Bob Gates uh, said, 
uh, some years ago, and the, the trends have only accelerated since then. Gates said it's hard to conceive of anybody challenging the United States directly on the ground. It's insurgencies and, and terrorists that, that for centuries have found ways to make life hard for conventional militaries. We can expect that those asymmetric warriors will remain the contemporary problem we face for some years still to come. What have I told you tonight? Counterinsurgency is really, really hard. I thought I understood how hard it was. I called my book Learning to Eat Soup with a Knife, which doesn't make it sound very fun. And then I got to try it myself and found out it was even harder than I thought. Counterinsurgency is hard. Despite that, militaries can figure out how to do it, if not well, at least better. Winston Churchill said, you can always count on the United States to do the right thing after it has exhausted every possible alternative. <laughs> By the end of 2006, we had exhausted every possible alternative in Iraq. By 2009, we had exhausted every possible alternative in Afghanistan. It will be better when you are running the military if we don't wait quite so long uh, before we do the right thing. And finally, we've come a long way. The American military has adapted more in the last five years than in the previous 20. We, we've, we've developed unmanned systems with extraordinary range and power. We've, we've vastly increased the, the size and the capabilities of our intelligence systems. We can acquire knowledge in, in a number of ways. We can understand social networks, understand uh, why these groups are fighting us and how they're fighting us. And we are far, far better at figuring out how to dismantle them. We've come a long way, but we still have a long, long way to go. And it's going to be your generation's task to, to, to take this the rest of the way. Last month, a, a guy named Joe Klein, who writes for Time Magazine, wrote a story about what he called the new greatest generation of veterans from our current wars coming back and reshaping America. And in that story, Joe pointed out that what we call the greatest generation, rightly, the generation that, that struggled through the Depression and then saved the world from fascism and tyranny during the Second World War, great as that generation was, an awful lot of them were drafted. This time, the new greatest generation has volunteered to fight. An all-volunteer force has stayed fighting and is stronger now than it was at the start of this war 10 years ago because of the caliber of your generation of young people. And, and as uh, somebody from an old generation, a generation that's now moving past, let me say how much I admire and appreciate that and how much I look forward to your questions. Uh, I would like to know what you think about how um, anti-Western rhetoric plays a role in recruiting forces for Al-Qaeda and other insurgents and how counterinsurgency uh, warfare and efforts um, plan to mitigate or uh, work with that sort of anti-Western rhetoric. Mm -hmm. This is very much a global war of ideas we're fighting. We are not nearly as good at the war of ideas as we ought to be. We are fighting people who, in the name of Islam, kill Muslims, innocent Muslims, at wedding parties, kill families, kill children, recruit children to serve as suicide bombers. We do a horrible job of, of telling that story to our own people and, and to the people who believe in Islam, who practice Islam around the globe. And we have to do a better job of that. We are doing a better job on the, on the, of, of taking on recruiting on the internet, which is one of the places where they, they find their recruits. We are 
doing some very interesting things that I can't talk about in this forum, but, but this is an area where we are going to continue to need new thinking, good thinking, and, and bright talent. And if you're interested in this field, I'd urge you to, to help us think about how to do this better and to help us then implement those ideas more effectively. What exactly is, or I was just wondering if you could give us a little more on what Pakistan's motive is for harboring terrorists. So the, the, the history goes back to our efforts to punish the Soviet Union when it invaded Afghanistan in the 1980s. Pakistan uh, was how we funneled aid and assistance to the Afghan Mujahideen. And those supply links and some of those groups ended up in Pakistan uh, after the war with Afghanistan. This story is well told in, in Charlie Wilson's War, uh, a, a great book and also a very good movie that I encourage all of you to watch. Uh, some practices in the movie may not be in accordance with with uh, those of Brigham Young University. Um, Charlie Wilson was a, a congressman from Texas and a Democrat. You got to expect some of those things. Um, <laughs> Pakistan believes that the United States is going to leave Afghanistan. And when it does, it desperately wants to make sure that its arch enemy, India, does not gain control in Afghanistan. And so it, it is using these insurgent groups as an insurance policy to attack the government of Afghanistan, to make sure that the government of Afghanistan, which it believes is, is close to India, um, does not form an alliance. If, if it does, Pakistan is, is then uh, in a world of hurt, is surrounded, is, is, is the meat in the sandwich of Afghanistan and India. To defeat that thinking by Pakistan, there are a number of things we can do. We can help reduce tensions between India and Pakistan, something we're trying to do, but there's a lot of work still to be done here. It's, it's, it's another area I'd encourage uh, people who need term paper topics to take a look at. It's a real world problem that we're struggling with. But also, we have to convince Pakistan that we are in this for the long haul, that we are not going to abandon Afghanistan, that, that we will be the honest brokers in this region. And we have not been able to convince the Pakistanis of that because we keep talking about how much we want to leave. And, and perversely, just as in Iraq, when, when, when we said we wanted to leave, everyone acted as if we were leaving and, and, and made their own side deals. It was only when we said that we wanted to stay in Iraq, that we were going to stay as long as it was necessary, that we were able to, to change the situation on the ground. The same is true in Afghanistan. You've spoken a lot today in general terms about what needs to be done in a counterinsurgency, um, principles and things which should be done in Afghanistan and with Pakistan. But in your opinion, what, are, what specifically are the steps that we should be taking in order to go and turn the tide of the conflict? Um, <laughs> it's a good question. I've done a bunch of writing on this. I'll, I, I will um, tell you that we've done a lot of the things that I've, I, I got to, to um, testify before the Senate Foreign Relations Committee on this, which is pretty cool. Um, uh, and a lot of the ideas have been adopted. So, so building Afghan security forces is absolutely essential. Um, improving Afghan governance is important. Um, ironically, probably the single thing that would make the biggest difference at this point is lifting the tariffs that we currently uh, put in, in the United States on Pakistani textiles. So Pakistan believes very strongly that all we're doing um, that all we, the only thing we care about is Pakistan and Afghanistan as part of the, the, the so-called war on terror. To convince them that we really care what happens to the people of Pakistan, the single biggest thing we could do to provide those people economic opportunity would be to allow Pakistani textiles inside the United States. If I could get one thing for Christmas, 
that's what I would ask for. Uh, I will tell you that, that um, it is extremely unlikely to happen uh, because of the U.S. Congress and uh, competing domestic interests in the United States, which is, uh, I think, um, a, a, a short-sighted political decision, but is uh, nonetheless likely to make me unhappy at Christmas. Uh, sir, thank you for being with us tonight. Um, my, uh, I have kind of two questions that are connected. Um, first is, um, as uh, the military is uh, gearing up to decrease its budgets, um, to cut uh, its force structure, um, how, what do you see as the implications in terms of balancing the needs of uh, both a conventional and an unconventional um, strategy? Um, additionally, um, how do you see um, our engagement with um, China as an emerging regional superpower um, while specifically um, building weapons and doctrines to uh, target our ability to um, project power in the region? So those are the two biggest questions my think tank is struggling with right now. And if, uh, you know, if you're free for the next seven or eight months, we'd love to, to uh, we've got a cubicle for you. Um, <laughs> Great question. Really, seriously, great questions. The, the, and, and, and two of the biggest questions that the Pentagon, um, the, the Senate Armed Services Committee, all the folks who care about these things in Washington are struggling with. We are, we are currently going through a big um, uh, budget cutting exercise in the Pentagon. We're cutting $400 billion over the next 10 years, um, $40 billion a year. It adds up over time. Um, we may cut a whole lot more, as much as an additional $600 billion on top of that. Those cuts, I think, would be catastrophic. That will happen if the super committee cannot, cannot come to terms on another way to find uh, $1.2 trillion in cuts over the next 10 years. This is high stakes ball. The, the cuts that I think are, are, are likely to happen are largely U.S. Army end strength. I think the Army's going to get smaller. I think the Marines are going to get smaller. That usually happens at the ends of wars. I think that's okay. Um, and, and then I, I actually think that we are over-investing in manned uh, uh, fighter planes right now. And I think that, that uh, particularly given the capabilities that China has, what's called anti-access area denial capabilities, um, are, are the, the planes we're buying aren't gonna be able to get close enough to influence actions should, should, um, should China uh, decide to, to engage us in war. There are lots of reasons why that shouldn't happen. It's economically disadvantageous both for us and them, but um, there is lots and lots of friction, lots of rubbing uh, between U.S. forces and Chinese forces in the Western Pacific, and, and that is an object of great concern. The new thinking on, on that conflict is a, a doctrine called air-sea battle, uh, developed by, by one of my friendly competitors, another think tank called the Center for Strategic and Budgetary Assessments, CSBA. It's all about acronyms in Washington. Um, it, it's worth looking at, at air-sea battle, uh, which is a new way to engage the, the, the Air Force and the Navy to help them cooperate to try to ensure that the United States can maintain control over the sea lanes through the Western Pacific. The world center of gravity over the past decade or two has shifted from the Atlantic Ocean to the Pacific Ocean. That trend is likely to continue. Um, there is every reason why the rise of China should be a peaceful one, inshallah. We have to be ready if it's not. And is, is the last question from Superman? Um, first of all, thanks a lot for coming tonight. And I've actually got a twofold question. Um, first of all, in your experience in Al Anbar, um, you mentioned the police force and security forces being very threatened by the insurgents. How much complicity was there on the police part, like beyond simply being intimidated? How much complicity? And how much of the violence do you think was uh, just criminality taking advantage of the chaotic system? Great question. Um, it, it lets me end with a, with a, 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 a pretty tough war story. Um, when I arrived in, in Chaldea in September of 2003, we were on our, we, we got a brand new police chief. The, the previous one had just been killed uh, fairly brutally. He was the second police chief to be killed in the six months uh, since, uh, uh, since the invasion. 
so when 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 um, job tenure is is measured in months and and your your two predecessors have been killed, um, times are tough, right? It turned out that the the guy we got uh, was a, a, a retired uh, brigadier general in the Iraqi army. Uh, we, he and I had a lot in common. We both fought in Desert Storm, just on opposite sides. Uh, made for made for good discussions. Um, he was, uh, uh, as uh, I mentioned, that we started to cooperate with the police, they started to cooperate with us. Al-Qaeda in Iraq uh, was not very amused by this. They launched a, a truck bomb against the police station uh, the, the, the um, Saturday or Sunday in December 2003 when we captured Saddam Hussein. Uh, for me, that will, will always be the day of the car bomb on the police station. It killed 35 policemen. Uh, a number of, of children um, who were, were visiting their, their dads at the police station. Um, he survived that attack. My police chief survived that attack, uh, continued to cooperate with us. Um, he, he, several months later, faced an improvised explosive device in his own driveway uh, that wounded him, not severely, uh, but did send something of a message. Right? Imagine if you're the police chief. Uh, and you don't even control your own driveway. Your forces don't even control your driveway. Um, this was uh, just a, a few weeks before uh, the, the first battle of Fallujah. You'll remember uh, four Blackwater contractors took a wrong turn uh, and ended up being brutally murdered uh, by the people of Fallujah. Uh, two of their bodies hung from a bridge. Uh, that bridge, uh, Fallujah, was the, the next city uh, immediately to my east, and we attacked into the city, uh, accomplishing something fairly extraordinary. It was the first time the Sunnis and Shia had ever agreed on anything. Uh, they, they agreed that they really suddenly didn't like us. And um, I received multiple credible reports that my police chief was providing body armor, weapons, radios to the insurgents inside Fallujah who were fighting my guys. Stuff that I had provided him, he was giving to the insurgents who were fighting against us. And this is another one that's not in the books. I checked. Right? Nobody, there, there was nothing that told me what to do. I ended up doing nothing. I decided that that was the minimum tax he could pay to stay alive and remain my police chief, given the situation on the ground throughout Iraq. I, and, and we never spoke of it, and after the Battle of Fallujah stopped, he continued to cooperate with me, he continued to give me information on insurgents inside Chaldea. I still don't know if what I did was the right thing or not. I do know that if I had arrested him, that I didn't have anybody better to replace him with, and that I thought it was a price worth paying, knowing, knowing, that those weapons were being used against some of my friends. A good friend of mine, uh, not in the first Battle of Fallujah, but in the second, uh, ended up uh, um, being severely wounded by a rocket-propelled grenade, um, although it couldn't have been one of mine. It couldn't have been one that I had given my police chief and it ended up with him. I often, when I am with my friend, think about that decision I made and wonder if I got it right. And, and these are the kind of decisions that we are, are going to be asking you to make, um, th those of you in uniform, those of you who, who grow up and, and achieve positions of responsibility, political responsibility in this nation. Take advantage of this wonderful opportunity you have here to think about hard questions, to think about ethics, to study politics and history and culture and religion so that you are at least as well prepared as I was, hopefully much better, to make really, really hard decisions that, that ultimately, one way or another, you're going to have to make in your life. Thanks for, for taking the time to, to listen tonight. Thanks for your commitment to making the world a better place. Thank you all.